Hey guys, it's Sarah from Just My Typewriter, and I've already broken my microphone, so you know it's going to be a good day. So I collect typewriters. I have like 20-something typewriters. Every time I see a typewriter, I consider purchasing it. But one thing I've not gotten into at all are other writing instruments or other writing accoutrement, if you will. So today I thought I would try a few specialized dip pens, cartridge pens, get a little into the pen spirit, and see what happens. I am highly unqualified for any actual reviews on these products. I'm mostly testing them to see if it makes me write better, because the advantage of using a typewriter is that no one has to try to decipher my handwriting. So I went on Amazon and looked up a couple pen sets that I could try out today. I went for ones that had fast shipping and ones that looked like they were going to be interesting to play with, and ones that were admittedly a little on the cheaper side to try with my typewriters. So here's my Amazon haul. Well, not this. This is the Taylor Swift cassette for Evermore because I think it's the best album ever, and my car is 26 years old. Now my typical pen, and my favorite pen to use, is a free pen, which is why a lot of my pens are from promotional events, uh, come in weird colors, run out of ink after trying them once, are found in the bottoms of purses. I like to steal pens from friends. That's my kind of pen experience. Now I've also tried doing a little bit of calligraphy at one point in my life. I sucked at it, but I have used these calligraphy zig pens before and my mom loves using these. So I figured we'd use a free pen and a zig marker as kind of our control group against these pens. So this is the Feather Pen Nib Set. It looks like we've got about four nibs in there. One on the pen and then three additional ones. We've got this thing of ink, and then we have the Feather Pen itself. So this is a glass dip pen that doesn't come with ink. Good thing the Feather Pen does. Hopefully that'll work for this. And then we also have this pen, which has a bunch of writing in a language I don't understand on it. Open. Well, that's in English. Why didn't I just read that? So it looks like the pen is in there. And I have an ink cartridge and a cap. All of the instructions are in a different language. Why does this one also have a picture of a dip in it? What? <laughs> Uh-oh, I think I put a cartridge in there. Ooh, did you see, it just like filled up. It's like bleeding, uh-oh. So to test these pens, I'm going to have my control pens, and then I also have a normal sheet of paper, some card stock, and then some note cards that have typewriters on them that I might send to pen pals, but we'll just try one today to see if I'm actually capable of writing. Why are so many things requiring to be open today? Let's go through and just write my name, a sentence, something, on our control documents with our control pens. So I'm gonna start with my freebie pen. This is a free pen I found it in my purse, so. That's the extent of how much I've thought about this. So the pilot, Kakunu, Kakunu, Kakun, ka something, something pen. So we'll try this one first. This is the one I put the cartridge in. I don't even know how to use this thing. Do I just like, do I have to press? How does this work? There are no instructions. <laughs> Wait, ooh, there's ink coming out the top. Besides getting ink on my finger, that was pretty smooth. Um, and if you get ink on you, you can just wipe it on the white tablecloth. Am I changing my handwriting halfway through? Kind of looks like I'm changing my handwriting halfway through. Although if I were a serial killer, that would be great because then you couldn't identify me later. Okay, that was that pen, the pilot pen. It doesn't seem to be leaking but I don't know how ink doesn't just constantly fall out of that unless it's like pressure based. But again, I know absolutely nothing. So next we're gonna have to try one of these dip pens that involve ink, which means it's about to get messy in here. So because the glass dip pen requires ink and I have absolutely no idea what the differences are between a feather pen and that, I'm hoping that this one has some instructions. So let's take some of these pieces out of here. 
Oh wait, there's no ink. What? That's a scam. There's no ink that comes with it. It's just the empty bottle. Oh no. <laughs> I'm severely underprepared for this now. Maybe I could use the ink from this pen. Let's see if I can take this ink cartridge out of here. Can I dip stuff into that? Ugh. Oh no, I got it on my finger. Oh no. <laughs> Wait a second. Okay, hold on. Let's put this back in here. So I bought this Deluxe Star printing press toy for a different video, which I'll link in the description below. But I think it comes with ink. Oh, it leaked. Did it leak everywhere? Well, there's ink everywhere. But we have some ink now because the stupid feather pen set didn't come with ink. Okay, we have some ink on the tip of the pen. I'm finding I have to hold it like at a really weird angle because of this top guild thing. Finally, let's try the glass dip pen now that I have some ink. I can try this one. This feels really fancy. It kind of feels like I'm more scratching into the paper than like actually writing on the surface. Although it's cool to look at. I don't know about this one, folks. I think between the three of them, I like the aesthetics of the glass pen the most, but I cannot figure out how to do it. I don't understand. I don't know, it doesn't seem like any ink is actually collecting at the, the tip point nib of the pen itself. At least on the feather pen, I felt like I was getting some ink on the page. I didn't feel like I was scratching as deep into the paper, even on the cardstock. I felt like I really had to press in with the glass pen compared to the feather pen, but I really did not like this decorative piece on the feather pen at all because it really limited my range of motion. The Pilot pen, this pen was great. I had no problems with this pen except for the fact that I worry about ink seeping out of it, but maybe it won't. Maybe I'm just worried about nothing. Are there things about pens I don't know? Absolutely. So let's talk to a few pen people. All right. So I'm, I'm rolling over here. Um, yeah. So this is, let me give you a little background of what's going on here. So I have a YouTube channel where I talk about typewriters like a maniac. Um, and I've been filming a couple of videos for them while I'm home. And I filmed one on pens that I just like bought on Amazon to try out some like fancy pens and they were all terrible. So I wanted to get like some perspectives from actual people who use fancy pens um, and like what your guys' background might be in like using fancy pens, what other things you might collect, just some perspective on historical writing machines because the ones from Amazon kind of suck. Yeah, it's actually funny you should mention terrible pens from the internet because way back when I actually gave Victor one of my pen finds, which was a clone of a Parker 51 from Alibaba or some such. It was maybe two bucks. And so I didn't really expect it to be anything good, right? But I was rather I impressed. And I hope you were also rather impressed, Victor. I'd hate to give a bad gift. So how did you get into like, how did you know to, to give Victor a fancy clone pen? Like, how did you even get into having cool older pens? Honestly, I was trying to remember that myself, right? And I can't quite pinpoint what point in time that might have been, but it really seems for me they collect just because you're going around to flea markets and even other people's houses and like these people have old pens and they certainly don't want them. Or you're digging through like imagine grandma's junk drawer but eight foot by six foot on some flea market guy's table and just filled with all sorts of things pens, watches, knives, you know, just junk. And you gotta dig through and find, that was actually how I came to find, two uh, Parker 21s. And I think I paid like $2 for both of them. Wonderful deal, but really the hunt almost became the reason why, because it was fun to just look for them. And I'm sure you might feel the same way about typewriters as well. And so that, although I can't give you an exact reason why, that definitely has to be part of it for me at least. What about you, Victor? Why, how'd you get into pens and why, why are you into them? 
Uh, so I, I've always been into the weird, strange things that no one else seems to care about anymore or is into. Uh, one of my favorite pastimes uh, as a child, admittedly, I don't do it as much anymore, was going out to antique stores and just, uh, I'm the type of person who generally tries, who enjoys going into stores, but generally tries not to because I'm the type of person who will look at every aisle every item. So flea markets are uh, a generally a no-go for me and antique and antique malls because I will stop by every single booth and look at every item. Like, you never know what you're going to find. So it's important to uh, stop by and look. As to specifically with fountain pens, uh, growing up, I, I always had an interest for history and historical things. So I, I thought that I was the cool kid on the block by studying my colonial writing instruments. And uh, I thought, oh, hey, these you know quill things are pretty cool, but they're antiquated. Uh, you might have a couple of samples. Uh, I was tempted as a child to make my own quill pen, which I actually still have to this day uh, from a feather I found in the lawn. Probably not very healthy to just go picking up feathers, but I did. Uh, and then lo and behold, years later, I got older, got to high school. And I never really put much thought into it. Uh, at that time, I was a pencil elitist to where I believed that the pencil was a superior writing instrument since it was erasable and uh, allowed you to make mistakes. And I uh, would profess my undying love and affection for the way of the pencil. However, I realized uh, after meeting Nick and he used a, a Pilot Namiki Pro uh, no, awesome. it was a custom heritage. No, yeah, it was a custom, custom heritage, heritage 912. Yeah, yeah. The I custom believe. heritage 912 with the posting nib, which I have oh, wow. to you this day. Wow. I've, I've to this day wanted that pen, but I still have yet to buy it. Fortunately, it's still for sale on Amazon. Uh, that was my, I, I had the distinct pleasure. That was the best, best like minute and a half of my life of using that nib. And uh, to this day, I've not found one that I've liked nearly as much. Although I feel like it's probably nostalgia at this point. So eventually when I do get the pen and use it, I'll probably be like, eh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I found this pen and I thought, hey, you know, this is something really cool. This is a way to bridge that gap. A way to use something that has that kind of antiquated feel, the more sophisticated professional feel to it. And something that one of the things I, I always found myself attracted to the things that, as I mentioned, seemed antiquated. No one else really did anymore. And to me, I thought, well, how many people have fountain pens? Like it's a practical thing that you can use that also sets you apart and uh, makes yourself stand out and is a reflection of yourself generally. Uh, as I mentioned, I almost always have ink on my hands, ink stains from all the fountain pens and all the different inks. and. Uh, I, I always know I can trust someone when you go out in public and you see a stranger and they have ink stains on their hands because you know that they must be a sophisticated individual who uses fountain pens. So Nick gave me a fountain pen, which he had mentioned, and that started my long descent into darkness. Uh, I, oh, don't try and blame me on that. Oh, <laughs> oh I, I've, I've tried uh, probably over a hundred different types of ink, uh, all different types, all different colors. I have quite a few fountain pens now, all different types, and uh, I'm always happy to try more. Uh, so that was kind of my story of how I got started with it. Started out just basic historical interest. I dabbled in dip pens a little bit. They're a lot of work, kind of messy. Oh no, I got it on my finger. Oh no. <laughs> a lot of cleanup. Uh, and then I discovered the world of fountain pens and I never went back. And now I'm a pen elitist. Fountain pen elitist specifically. Well, how many do you guys have? Like, how many fountain pens do you have? Well, that's a. I should have thought you were going to ask that question. It's a very reasonable one. At least I'd say myself ten of varying sorts, like seven or eight that are I could write with probably right now, and maybe a couple that either aren't really worth pursuing because they're just they were cheap pens in their day, and I don't really care for them so much now. Some that I maybe broken. I have a, a pilot that falls into that category because I dropped it in Latin class actually <laughs> if you recall so I'm gonna say 11 final answer uh, I just counted and the tally comes in at 16 oh you beat me <laughs> nice 
Yeah, so it is exponential progression on my end. How are you finding the the fountain pens that you're adding to your collection? And are there any like specific ones that you're constantly just like your holy grail pen, like you're always on the search for that specific fountain pen? Uh, so there's a combination of different things and it depends more or less what I'm looking for. Uh, if I have something specific in mind, a specific feature, a specific uh, functionality, or if I'm just looking to try out something new in general. If I'm looking just to try out something new in general that I've never tried out before, a new type of nib, a new type of flow mechanism, then I will usually buy new. Uh, but my go-to place is Goulet Pens, and they have a great selection there all across the board. They have a great selection for beginners, great selection for intermediate collectors, and a great selection for the advanced collectors who are willing to spend thousands of dollars on a single pen probably to never write with it because it costs thousands of dollars. Uh, but that's the kind of thing where you buy something new to try something new. For a lot of these pens, my, I guess, general way I like to find them is in drawers, in rummage sales, junk sales, yard sales, flea markets, anywhere that I can get a nice cheap pen, maybe a little bit banged up, but if I can clean it up, fix it up and have something nice, something that you know, it was a little different maybe from other pens I have, then that's really, you know, the best thing I can get as far as I'm concerned. That would be my goal. And so really on those ends, I don't have much of what you might call a grail pen because I'm not really interested in maybe completing a collection perfectly or, you know, finding one super rare, awesome thing. I'm just in it for the hunt you know, what's out there, what comes to me naturally almost in that respect. Well, yeah, to go yeah. to that, what's the, the coolest way you've come into a pen in your collection? Like what's the coolest way you found one or like a really like significant story to you? I know Victor's got ones from like, oh, Nick Lashinsky gave me this pen, <laughs> you know? So like- what's Well, that's just the end all be all. <laughs> uh, of course. So like what's a story you have of like maybe finding one or one that like just kind of knocked your socks off when you found it. I mean, for me, I did reference the uh, Parker 21, you know, digging through a yard, like a, just a big old tray of junk. That was one of the earliest pens I actually found in that manner. And that's, that's really special. And then Victor mentioned my custom heritage 912, not a vintage pen. I did buy it new. Mm -hmm. So maybe a little bit in the weeds for our purposes, but I'll never forget what I did to get the money to buy it, which was, actually cleaned out a hoarder's house, which if you've ever seen like TLC in the show Hoarders, I don't particularly like it as TV, but imagine just like a jam-packed house filled with all sorts, all the stuff you could imagine. Just floor to ceiling, two floors, attic, basement. It was a hot summer day. It did not smell very good, no AC. And so I remember working two days doing that and at the end, got my check. Then I guess I decided to trade just about the whole thing in for a pen, which was a little bit crazy, but I look upon it fondly. I'm not really sure that I have any particular special stories. Um, considering how most of them I either bought with my own money uh, or they were gifts, a, a lot of it doesn't have a specific story, but I, I think the one that probably has the most interesting story associated with it, but it's not really one that I put on it, is, again, as I mentioned, the Parker Vacuumatic, um, just because this is the pen that got Parker through the Great Depression. This model, uh, they, even through the Great Depression, they continued to sell the Vacuumatic models uh, somehow. <laughs> uh, to this day, I'm trying to figure that out. I've tried to flex my academic muscles to figure out how the economy worked in which people still had money in the Great Depression to buy these pens from Parker, but uh, they were very clever with their finances and with what they charged people and where they distributed them. Um, so that one has some interesting history to it. And I guess the other pen that may have uh, an influence on me, it's one that I like using a lot. It doesn't really have a neat history to it. It's just, I figured, hey, I should try it out. Uh, and I ended up really liking it, is the uh, Twisby Eco. It's a demonstrator pen, which means it's a clear body, and it's a, a piston filler pen. So the entire body here is actually the ink reservoir. 
and it piston fills. Uh, so you get a ton of ink in here and piston filling fountain pens are usually on the more expensive side. Uh, but Twisby decided to revolutionize the pen game and make uh, piston filling pens cheaper. Uh, so, But I got it because it was a demonstrator pen. I wanted to try out demonstrator pens. I wanted to uh, embrace the color of ink that I had. And uh, that's one of the downsides of the opaque body pens is so much of the fountain pen experience isn't about the pen itself, but also about the ink. Uh, there are different schools of thought. Some argue that it is entirely about the ink and the pen is the secondary aspect, uh, a medium with which the ink doth flow. Uh, and then there are others who claim that the ink is just, you know, it's just a medium for which the pen does its job. Uh, but here you can really appreciate the best of both worlds. You can appreciate the engineering of the pen through the clear body. And you can also appreciate the ink color that you have before it even goes down on paper. And then my final question is because you guys spend a lot of time in antique stores like I do, are there other things that you collect or look for when you're out there just on the hunt in an antique store or yard sale or you just run into on Craigslist? Do you like run into other antique items that you might find yourself collecting? I mean, I for one am also sort of a photographer. So cameras have always been, they're probably the first thing I really collected to any length. And in some ways I'm more proactive in collecting them because I will actually go and look for certain things. Say I'm looking for a particular lens or some such. So I might actually get on eBay just to find one right now and pay a little more, maybe not. But I've found that as time goes on, I've sort of moved over towards and letting them come to me approach, sort of like the pens. Uh, in terms of myself, things that I look for, uh, as I said, I'll kind of look a little bit at everything, see if anything sticks out. Uh, there's a lot of little doodads and knickknacks and stuff like that that might stick out to me, different historical things, maybe different topical things that interest me. So I, I keep an eye out for things like that. Uh, fountain pens, uh, something else I keep an eye out for are things like stamps, something else that, in my opinion, uh, has a story. Uh, for, for me, my stamp collection uh, would probably not be the envy of any serious stamp collector, because I, I have a ton of stamps. I have a ton of stamps in there that are not in the best condition, uh, but they're legible, and to me, that's what matters. Uh, to me, it's, it's more about the historical value of having stamps in there. I have stamps from Oh, I don't know, probably over a hundred countries, uh, historical stamps going all the way back to the, the mid 1800s, all the way through up until whenever stamps got boring and started just being digitally printed. Uh, they're no fun anymore. And so you're not a fan of a stamps.com then? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, give me good old fashioned one color, stamp that was etched etched somewhere and then put through a printing press that's that's my kind of stamp i think finding the i think finding the value in things is far more important than the actual things themselves and uh, i think that's the primary difference between collectors uh, enthusiasts and hoarders uh, collectors uh, often collect items, again, for the specific item, for the specific monetary value of it, or the specific historical or artistic value of it, where they, you know, they think, oh, I could sell this to a museum or whatever. Uh, and, but enthusiasts, I, I would consider different than collectors, a uh, type of collector. So uh, all enthusiasts are collectors, but not all collectors are enthusiasts. Uh, because an enthusiast realizes the inherent value of the item itself. Uh, being the item, the uh, history that it brings, the inherent value that it might have that is non-tangible, uh, that extends past just the numeric price tag on it. And uh, this is why I recommend uh, many people, it, it can be very fulfilling finding something that you can be enthusiastic about. And it doesn't even have to be something particularly physical. Uh, it can be something more digital, I guess, or <laughs> more abstract. I think it's interesting to think about like uh, people our age, because we're younger in the collector communities, right? Than a lot of- Better be younger. <laughs> Don't make me old yet. 
<laughs> well, we're younger than a lot of the people that we might be in the communities with that we're collecting around. Um, Definitely. It's interesting to, to see people like us and to see people like Victor who can speak from such a elevated position and have such a philosophy behind your collecting. And I think it's really valuable. And I think there is something interesting coming from the fact that you also collect antique items and you feel that way about them and you uh, understand the value in them, even though you're a younger person in your collector community. You know, I really think there is almost a crossover between a growing consciousness of maybe the sort of single time use society, right? And the fact that there are still, there are valuable objects out there that aren't being used. And maybe this is in its own small way, a reflection of that. And so I definitely see there being room in any community, certainly vintage or collecting to grow just on those respects alone that this is something that I think really interests a lot of people and that has room to grow. Yeah, I think that's a really important statement to make, uh, especially in the modern disposable society and a society fueled on uh, instant gratification is something to keep in mind. I encourage everyone to think of is instant gratification can seem great in the moment and disposability, use it, then you're done with it. You don't have to keep it. You don't have to maintain it. You just throw it out and get a new one if you need a new one. Uh, something I encourage everyone to think about is the experiences that we get whenever we have instant gratification and the physical items we get that are disposable and designed to give us instant gratification. Uh, think about the impact that you have on the future, on generations to come, is uh, you are not contributing in ways, many ways that those historically have. You're not contributing to that, to that future story. I mean, the artifacts that we generate today are not in exist won't be in existence because they're disposable they'll be in trash heaps uh so a pen you pick up a ballpoint pen today 100 years from now no one's going to have that pen no one's going to pass it down no one's going to cherish it i mean and fountain pens there are some fountain pens that have been around for 50 60 70 years passed down through generations people have had them forever and with other different types yeah <laughs> with other different it's types lovely of historical artifacts, you see things that have been passed down much longer than that, and not even just passed down, but things that continue to be usable and useful. And especially in certain rural communities, you see people still using items that seem so incredibly antiquated now, but it's just a part of their life and they've continued it and they've maintained it. And these old farm machinery, they've, I mean, sure, they could buy something newer, they could probably afford something newer, or it'll probably do the job faster and better. Uh, but there's just something to having that bit of history there, having that participation, that cross-general perspective. And uh, whenever you really stop and think about that, it, it almost seems uh, selfish to participate frequently without putting any forethought into just disposing of items and, and the instant gratification. Uh, because you think, well, these experiences are great for me right now. These items are great for me right now. I have everything I ever want, everything I ever need, when I want it, as I want it. Don't have to put in additional work or thought after I'm done with it. Just use it and dispose of it. But then there's nothing left behind for future generations to pick up on. Something I often think about as well. In a thousand years from now, <laughs> what are archaeologists going to do when they look back at the year 2020? What are, what are they going to find? It's so much of it's so much of our society has just become in the moment that I, I feel like a lot of people have lost that appreciation for older things. And I mean, right, I know a lot of people, a lot of younger people, especially who view antiques as, well, why do I need that if I can do something that works better, easier? Uh, but it's important to keep in mind that everything you're using today will be antique. So you think all those antiques are obsolete and worthless and oh, they're, they're pointless. Well, the people using them when they were first made didn't think that. It's weird to think that like an iPhone could end up in an antique store, you know, like a vintage in the box, mint condition, <laughs> never opened, <laughs> like iPod or iPhone could end up in the future if they still have antique stores, you know, in like mm -hmm. a place like that. And that'll be the like 
this is what 2020 was like. This is what they used. Like, it's weird that that's going to be our stamp on human history. Yeah. It's little. I mean, <laughs> the thing that yeah. worries me, if you look at, say, even an iPod from like 2005, you can reasonably fix that to some general degree versus like the iPhone of today. I mean, Apple and many companies really don't want to produce things that are free for you to fix or repair. And Victor mentioned about, you know, you can keep the old tract around or certainly buy a new one. Well, if your options are, I can, I know how to fix this old tractor, or I have to take this new one to my John Deere dealer, it's a harder choice. And all of these pens that I have, I'll flash them maybe a little bit slower. <laughs> all of these I have, you know, done a little bit of work on. I've put in new sacks. And I mean, they're not complicated machines per se, right? But there is, I'm able to do that. I have the choice and... I think that's important in coming back around to what's the society we want to have. Do we want to try and reduce our footprint? Do we want to, you know, really be efficient or, I mean, I don't think we really have much of a choice, but I believe that it's possible. I believe that we're going in the right direction. I really do believe that people want these things so maybe this is a way to get there maybe it's not and we're just having fun i'm okay with both i'm gonna i'm gonna stop the recording there before we let yeah, <laughs> yeah. two more hours if you're interested in content about typewriters, check out some of the other videos on this channel. We also have an Instagram at just.my.typewriter. i want to thank you so much for watching today and remind you you're just my type of pen no, wait, that's wrong.